Thank you for coming out today. And uh, you know, you've made me happy that I see you all here today, and so it's my job to make you happy. And uh, one of the things that I would like to do would be uh, to uh, answer any questions that you have. I'm not offended if you ask questions. So if you've got something you would like me to clarify or talk about a little more, uh, please, uh, pl you know, please let, raise your hand, let me know, or, or we'll, we'll talk about it. I came to town in 1971, and I consider myself a newcomer, not because uh, that's just kind of the way it works out. But I've uh, been interested in trains. I can never remember when I wasn't interested in trains. And so what I'm going to try to do today is talk about the change that's gone into, uh, into railroading. And we're going to have a primary focus here on, um, on uh, Nobles County. When I was putting this thing together, there was something that caused me to take note. I have a love-hate affair with these blasted cell phones. And maybe some of you do too. I can, I can already tell there's a few of you that agree with me. But I think we are looking at a, I'm gonna call it a impending historical disaster because I think there's an awful lot of photos that have been put on cell phones. And then when you get a new cell phone, you throw the old one in the closet, or it gets turned in so that they can give it away or whatever it is, and all of the photos that you've taken are lost. And so all I'm saying here is, is that if you've got some interesting stuff, some valuable stuff on your cell phones, start thinking about a way that you can get that transferred over. And the other thing that's gonna happen here, I, I learned this from experience too, if in doubt, take pictures. I mean, this, this digital thing is so fantastic, you can always delete it. But I've got a few situations here where I really regret not having it. So uh, now that we've got that out of the way, uh, I've kind of liked country music. And one of the things I like about country music is, is not that it's a model for living, but it gives you an understanding of people. Some of the experiences that people go through, some of the emotions that people have, and Tom T. Hall had a song that I kind of got a kick out of, and it was some poet was asking him about the facts of life. And he says, the facts of life is faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. And uh, so maybe we should interpret that a little bit. And uh, faster horses, I think we know what that's all about. Uh, younger women, well, let's put it this way. I'm going to talk about myself. I'm uh, 77 years old, going on 78, and quite frankly, I just don't have the strength and stamina that I did 50 years ago, and I've got a feeling there might be a few others here that would agree with that. Uh, older whiskey, I think, has, has to do with the quality, and more money, well, I don't think we need to talk about that. I think everybody understands that one fairly well. But when we look at the railroads, I think we look at the consolidation and technology is what has driven an awful lot of uh, what's going on. Consolidation, if we go back to 1970 when the Burlington Northern was put together, who all went into the Burlington Northern? It was the Great Northern, Northern Pacific, the Burlington, Fort Worth and Denver, uh, SPNS, you just went on and on. Uh, you know, locally, the Rock Island is gone, the Milwaukee is gone. I mean, we, we just go on and on, fewer railroad companies. Big standardization and equipment, a uh, lot less track mileage, and of course, focusing is, uh, is a lot more, uh, uh, okay. So we talk about technology, and okay, locomotives are completely different machines now than they were a few years ago. Uh, we've got cabooses are gone. You maybe remember a caboose, uh, fewer people. Uh, a lot of other things here have happened as well. What happened in Nobles County? Well, I believe our main line since the 1970s has been rebuilt twice. I think the Chicago Northwestern rebuilt it, and uh, Union Pacific did it here not too many years ago. As I recall, the uh, uh, yard here in Worthington got upgraded significantly, uh, and then we got that new yard out at uh, Elk Creek. And, uh, oh, come on, no. Uh, just a few shots here now of the uh, uh, Highway 60 uh, project out there when they built that new bridge. And uh, that got to be quite a project. And uh, that little white building to the left there, you might recognize uh, uh, bachelors, uh, you know, there. And um, 
you know, that's as it's getting a little closer, and, um, and I believe that is uh, looking back into the yard. And uh, uh, they did some modifications there so that the track would uh, kind of bypass the yard and, and uh, go across the, the new bridge. And, uh, and that's the thing when it was about done, and they were starting to tear out the old one. And of course, that's one of the very first trains that uh, came across the new bridge. Okay, now you ladies may get a little bit bored with this. I, I recognize that. Some of you guys may get a little bit excited. In 1970, a typical locomotive that was stationed here in town would have been a, a Jeep 7 or a Jeep 9, 1,500 or 1,750 horsepower. Weight of that locomotive was 246,000 pounds. Uh, it had a V16 engine in it, 567 cubic inches per jug. 65,000 pounds starting effort, 40,000 pounds uh, pulling effort. A typical road locomotive at that same time would have been an, one of the SD40 family, and there were several different versions of that, but a quite a bit heavier, a little more horsepower. Uh, the starting effort and the uh, pulling power was quite a bit more. But then we've had something else happen. Has anybody heard of EPA? Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, think about your automobiles. I mean, you know, the uh, emissions reductions, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. Well, this has affected the uh, rail industry as well. And they've been going through all of the different tiers uh, as they've had the reductions in emissions. The, oper the situation we're working with right now is tier four, which is going to be an 86% reduction in what goes out of the stack uh, on a locomotive. You know, you don't see them smoke anymore. Uh, so that means a typical road locomotive today is going to be a General Electric uh, 432,000 pounds, 4,400 4, horsepower, a V12 instead of a V16. Uh, they got, look at the, uh, the effort on it, but I'll go to this next one here now because that'll give you uh, a little more about it. Uh, General Electric isn't telling anybody anything about it because it's one of the very few tier four locomotives or uh, motors out there that doesn't have to use exhaust recycling or uh, DEF. And it, they, they don't let anybody work on it but themselves. But if we're gonna compare the weight of that Jeep 9 and the uh, General Electric, not quite double. Look at the starting effort three times the starting effort of what it had, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Four times the pulling effort on that. I mean, that is what technology has done with these locomotives. And of course, when you see one of them, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty big piece of machinery. Paint scheme in the 1970s, this was one of them. Uh, this was a Jeep 35 uh, down, uh, uh, heading out towards uh, Agate or Org. And, uh, I'm going to go into now a little bit of a transition here. Chicago Northwestern got a contract to haul taconite pellets from the Iron Range in northern Minnesota to a, a, a smelter out in Provo, Utah. And they wanted to, well, they were in a unique position because they thought they could use the same cars and same train set and haul uh, coal on the backhaul, so they could go loaded both ways. Chicago Northwestern did not have the power to do it. And they went and they got power from about anybody that would let it go. And uh, this is all stuff that came through Worthington. Some of you maybe remember them, ore trains that came through. Uh, but here was a, uh, a Burlington Northern unit. We had the uh, uh, ex-Conrail units. Uh, here was an ex-Missouri uh, uh, Pacific or Mopac unit. Um, and this was down here by Org. We had a lot of uh, very interesting stuff that uh, came through town. Uh, and of course, then towards the end, we ended up with the, uh, the bright yellow paint and all of that stuff is uh, going on. Um, 1995, Union Pacific took over the Chicago Northwestern. A lot of uh, changes in color. Uh, boy, they just purged a lot of equipment. 
and uh, they wanted to standardize things. Uh, and of course, we started seeing the, the yellow and gray locomotives in town. And uh, one of the things that happened, it was this period of time when the Union Pacific uh, took over a whole bunch of other railroad companies as well. I mean, they took over the Southern Pacific, and part of that was the, uh, uh, was the Rio Grande, and they took over the Missouri Pacific and the Western Pacific. I mean, they took over anybody that they could uh, talk to. But we started seeing locomotives come through here uh, that were strange locomotives like we'd never seen before in this part of the country. Uh, Rio Grande, for example, uh, was in town. Uh, Oh, come on. Then, when they had so many new locomotives coming in, they couldn't paint them all fast enough, and so they started patching them. You see that yellow patch right underneath the, uh, the cab. And uh, so they were uh, trying to get them all moved in. Why do they have different numbers on different locomotives? Every locomotive is gonna have a unique number because if you're going to be sending out a track warrant or identifying, if you've got three locomotives in the same area that have got the same road number, you know, they might drive into each other. They might have all kinds of confusion as far as what uh, uh, directions they're going to have as far as operating. We saw all kinds of lease units come here because, again, they wanted to get rid of all of the junk and they wanted to get the uh, higher horsepower, uh, more reliable units, and uh, they couldn't build new ones fast enough, so they leased a lot of these other ones. And we saw a lot of, of uh, lease stuff come through here. Um, now, this is a, a helm unit that was in town. And uh, this is a, uh, one that was built in Canada, and uh, that came through here. Uh, Oh, now we've got, uh, Worthington was very special. This is a, a, an EMD, which stands for the Electromotive Division of General Motors. And that was the same, if you had a General Motors automobile, uh, this was the a division of that same uh, big company. What they ended up doing is taking a bunch of the old locomotives, taking all the parts off of them, taking the parts and rebuilding them back into a, uh, uh, a, new, a new unit. They built three of them. Worthington was lucky enough to have one of them uh, here for a long time, and uh, one of three built. And uh, it, oh, it was interesting. I just happened to be by the depot, and some guy come through town, and I could tell he was out of town in a real fat heat. When he saw that thing, he locked up his brakes and out came the Camry immediately. Uh, this is a, another EMD unit, but that other unit behind it is uh, 122. So we've had several of those locomotives from this class of three, of three that were here in Worthington. So we were kind of special there for a while. And uh, some more colorful ones, EMD leasing. Oh, I wish this thing was worked a little. And then they came, we got to see some, even some uh, newer ones come through. And this is a, uh, some of you uh, train bus might know what a 6,000 horsepower unit was. And uh, the motors just couldn't stand up to it, so they're all, they're all gone now. Uh, they've been all rebuilt into, uh, into other units. Oh. Union Pacific liked to do some commemorative stuff too. I mean, they could be very hardcore, but yet at the same time, uh, they would get kind of excited about some things too. And here was one they had painted up uh, uh, to honor the uh, United Way in town. Union Pacific also did a series of locomotives to honor the uh, railroads they had taken over. And this was the Chicago Northwestern. And this one uh, photograph I took up by here in Lake, but it was headed towards Worthington, so I figured I could include it. But uh, they also had the uh, Southern Pacific unit uh, that I was able to photograph. And the other locomotives have come through town here, sometimes in the hour of darkness, sometimes in the hours when I was not available. So we do see some interesting things come through here from time to time. And this is one of the more current schemes right now as far as paint. We talk about change. 
One of the big handling things is, uh, now some of you guys that are farmers, you, you, you tell me if I'm too far off on this. Back in the 1970s, corn yields 75 to 100 bushel. In fact, you know, I know people that bragged when they got 100 bushel of corn. Soybeans, 20 to 35, and I think I have combined 18 bushel of soybeans and was happy to have that. Um, I was a traveling salesman, and I remember the elevator manager in, at uh, Hills told me that Rock County had to import corn because they had enough cattle feeders in Rock County that they would actually, imp they fed more corn than they could raise. And of course, we had boxcars and hopper cars. It was that transition. Some of you guys, or, or people may remember Ron Markman. Uh, I think he's now deceased. Uh, but I know he worked at the elevator, and I asked him one time about the, these boxcars. He says, in a good day, we could load three boxcars. And that was, that was all they could load, was three, uh, because they had to put all the wood grain doors in and the way the spouting and all of that stuff worked on it. So what happened now? Yields have doubled. Just look at all the hogs that are fed in Nobles County. I mean, you know, and we're still exporting grain, and look at all of the processing that we're doing around here. How does, the ha how does the shipping go? Well, well now we're going into a dedicated unit, unit trains. And I think we're up to, what is a unit train now? It's gotta be 110 plus cars I think they wanna go with now. And roughly figuring, you know, if a hopper car goes 3,000 bushel and a uh, box car was 100 bushel, just think of the extra capacity that we're using to uh, ship stuff out of town. This is one of those times I wish that I had taken more pictures because Consolidated Co-op had, according to my memory, the first unit train loading facility in the state of Minnesota, and it got to be quite a bit out of there. I mean, they were real leaders. And they could load 25 cars out on that east side of town. And uh, how did they move those cars? They had a Minneapolis Moline U or UB, I forget which it was, uh, that old yellow Minneapolis Moline tractor. And the reason they liked that, it had the hand clutch and they had the platform down there and, uh, and they could uh, uh, move th stuff around and never even had to get up in the seat. You know, they could drive around there. And uh, so, I mean, Worthington was a leader in the area. So what's changed? This, these pictures are taken up at Maloma. They're taken on the south end. Now, what does Maloma stand for? Milwaukee, Omaha Crossing is what it stands for. And uh, Nobles County, we completely lost the Rock Island as well, did the whole area. Uh, Chicago Northwestern had a line that came out of Heron Lake, Minnesota and went west. And I think that thing went through, uh, was it Kimberley, and then ended up going up uh, through, like through Slayton and then going down Highway 30, and, and that's all gone. And uh, the reason I remember that line was is that uh, my grandparents lived uh, just about a mile and a half uh, west of uh, Heron Lake, and that steam engine would go through there, and uh, that, that's one of the reasons I got hooked on trains. Milwaukee, of course, that came out of Jackson and went through Maloma, and then that went through Dundee and uh, Fulda as it worked its way west. And, you know, it's, it's gone. It's salvaged. Uh, what else is gone? 40-foot boxcar is gone. Uh, friction bearings on the trucks, on the wheels, they're all gone. When was the last time you saw a caboose? You know... What's that? Pioneer Village. Pioneer Village, okay. Hey, very. Right now, if you see a caboose, it's either going to be an extremely hazardous uh, consist in that train, or it's going to be have an awful lot of switching. There's, there's a one job up at, in uh, Burlington, Northern Santa Fe, up in the Twin Cities that still has a caboose. But I mean, no, they're, they're, they're basically gone. And... Uh, But when they were getting rid of the cabooses and stuff, we did have some interesting stuff come through here. We had uh, Conrail came, stuff came through, Rock Island stuff came through here. Uh, there's a Missouri Pacific caboose. And uh, of course, then Union Pacific, Uncle Pete had to show up with uh, some of their latest too. Today, you may see some trains that have got four, five, six locomotives up front. 
Not all of those locomotives may in, be in service. Uh, many times what they're doing with those, uh, they'll have, uh, say, three locomotives will be basically along for the ride because they're being delivered to like maybe a grain facility or something like that to take a unit train out of town or something like that. So uh, if you see a big long bunch of uh, locomotives, it's not always uh, uh, mean they're all running. We today see a lot of mid-train locomotives. And these are what they call DPUs, or distributed power units. Burlington Northern was playing around with distributed power units back in the 1970s. 1970, even before that. And they had certain locomotives were set up as masters, some of them were set up as remotes. And the problem that they had back then was they could not have reliable train signals to run the uh, remote locomotive. So if you open the throttle in the front one and the back one didn't open up, then you'd pull it, you know, things would start bucking and pulling apart. But one of the things that's allowed this technology to go into effect is that we've got more reliable uh, radio communications from locomotive to locomotive. And um, why do they want them in the middle? Well, you spread out the stress on the drawbars, uh, you've got acceleration and you've got braking uh, that is spread out, so it just gives you much, much better uh, control of the train. We've got something else that's happened, and that is what we call the FRED. And FRED stands for a lot of things, but I think the official terminology is the flashing rear end device. And basically what that thing does is, is that it kind of hooks into the air hose and stuff like that and it sends radio communications to the lead locomotive, to the cab up there, and says, yes, we've still got air pressure in the back and we still have a train that's together, you know, because if the train separates or something like that, they'll know that immediately. And so uh, what's happened there? All the boys that had a job riding in the back caboose, their memories. So to summarize some of these uh, operational changes, in the 1970s, a typical train was one mile, plus or minus a little bit. Today, we have trains up to three miles long coming through Worthington. I've counted the cars. I've talked to people up to three miles long. Scheduling. Back in the 1970s, everything was an extra. You know, when we've got a train ready to go, we'll call the crew and we'll let them go. Now they're trying to go into more precision railroading, which means that, say, maybe out in North Platte, Nebraska, we've got a train that is scheduled to go to Valley Park, Minnesota, and that train is going to leave at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The yardmaster gets paid a premium if he empties the yard, if he keeps his yard empty. They want to keep all this stuff moving. So they just take everything they've got in the yard, hook it behind the locomotives, whatever they need to do, put together a train, and if it's up to three miles long, they will let her go. Uh, and locomotives are uh, distributed. We've got the caboose uh, gone. Uh, the crews are smaller. You take two people handling uh, three miles a train. When you go back years ago, you had five people running 10, 12 cars. Uh, our rail is all continuous welded right now. Uh, we're using containers coming through here, and some of these can be foreign uh, containers which might be uh, come from overseas. Uh, we're also seeing containers being used lot, a lot more for domestic ship shipping. Uh, there's people like J.B. Hunt will have uh, and uh, Schneider are two big ones, and they will have a lot of West Coast to East Coast shipping or uh, West Coast to Chicago or, or places like that, uh, and then they'll offload the containers onto a, uh, uh, a trailer, and then they'll deliver them. Cars are, uh, uh, the carload weight has increased significantly. We really need to talk about some of the other changes and some of the other improvements that's going on in the rail industry. One of them is going to be shelf couplers. And uh, one of the problems when you would have a bunch of tank cars together and there would be a derailment, 
those tank cars would kind of tend to raise up, and then that coupler would just be a spear and, and uh, puncture the, uh, the uh, tank of the car next to it. And there was a lot of spills, there was a lot of fires, there was a lot of trouble. And what the shelf coupler does, it's got a, it's a, it's a bigger coupler, but it's got a, a, a flat spot up there that a lot, keeps the couplers from riding up and down if there's a, a, a problem. And so what happens then is, is that if there's a derailment, the cars will go sideways without, and, and reduce a lot of that, uh, that puncturing. Uh, something else that we're seeing with uh, tank cars is uh, placards. And uh, you'll have on the side of the car, it'll be a, a place, in, uh, like here now on this one, uh, 1987. Uh, gives you an idea what is in that. Uh, I'm part of the Model Railroad Club down in Sibley, Iowa, and I would invite all of you to feel welcome to uh, uh, view that when you get a chance, or when we would be happy to have you down there. One of our members was the fire chief from the uh, great town of Edgerton, Minnesota, and the fire department would get all of these, uh, there, there'd be a small booklet that would have to be in every truck, every vehicle, that would list all of the uh, numbers on, the, uh, uh, on these placards. So when the fire department would go out, they would see, Armand, were you on the fire department? No, no, okay. Uh, so if, if, I'm, if I'm not doing this completely right, uh, please correct me. But anyway, what happens is, is every vehicle has got to have the numbers. And so you, see, you come on to a, a, uh, an event and you know exactly what it is, you find out what the basic uh, instructions are on how to handle that. Is it ha how hazardous is, is there an inhalation hazard? Is there a, uh, uh, something else? And, uh, and then it gives you the, the response to go with that. So there's been, that's been a very good thing. Oh, I don't know. If you can see that real well from where I'm at, I can't. But uh, at the end of the car, they, for a while on the tank cars, they had uh, steel plates. Uh, uh, or shields that went on there. So in case the uh, tank cars would come apart, it would be extra protection. Uh, now, one of the things that I've seen here is, is that they're not doing this a whole lot anymore. It was just a, a number of cars that they did that on. And I believe what happened here was is, is that the original specifications on a lot of these tank cars, they used 3 8 inch steel. They went to half inch steel, you know, it should be uh, just a little bit thicker, a third thicker, and then they did not have to use the end plates. I think that's right, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Conspicuity stripes, uh, they've got all these yellow stripes on the side of the cars, and that's so at night, when your headlights shine on there, uh, you get that reflection, and if it's, you know it's a train. And I tell you what, you see a train at night and going, and it is awesome. It is awesome. I mean, those, uh, those things are, are, uh, are fantastic. Okay, this picture is taken just north of Sibley, Iowa, looking south. And there is a, a detector there. And uh, alongside the track, they've got all of these little different things there and what all that, how that works, I don't have any clue. But, uh, what a rail detector will do is, is that if there are bearings in the consist that are overheated, they will send a notice back up to the train, to the, to the uh, cab of the locomotive, that uh, so many axles back uh, that we've got an overheated uh, car, a uh, bearing. And so they're supposed to stop, check that out, and uh, probably set that car out, you know, so that they don't have a tr problem. Uh, it's also problems, they're supposed, some of this uh, information is supposed to go back to headquarters too, so that the dispatcher knows that you've got problems. Uh, if there's dragging equipment, uh, it's supposed to let you know, and, and of course it always comes back with the number of axles on the train, because if the train breaks in half, you know, breaks in half uh, it's kind of nice to know about that. So uh, detectors have uh, uh, come a long ways uh, helping out. Worker right to know. Uh, how many of you have been through Worker Right to Know? Okay. Uh, worker Right to Know is something that's come along. 
Well, I guess, I don't know, I guess it's been around 25, probably 28 years, I suppose. I taught worker right to know a lot. But anyway, what it is, is, is that it's training for employees at a business, and I'm sure the railroads have to go through the same thing, that certain materials that you're working with are, require certain ways of handling it, uh, what pro personal protective equipment you need, if you have a, an incident as far as uh, uh, a spill or, or uh, a contact with it, how do you handle that, you know, like if you're with anhydrous ammonia, I think water is always kind of nice to have around, and, uh, you know, with the first aid and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's been a lot of training going on as far as uh, uh, ways to be much safer. And usually when you hear about an incident, there's a story to go with it. Somebody did not do their job. And uh, I probably could tell you a whole bunch of stories, but uh, I don't know if I'm qualified to do that. But anyway, one of the things that we see too is graffiti. Has anybody noticed any graffiti? Yeah, we all have. And uh, this happened to be over just by, by Adrian, you know, on our, on our Ellis and Eastern. Uh, this one was up here by Worthington. Now, some of the things I have learned about graffiti, it might be a way of artistic expression, but I also understand that there's a method of communication that gets involved here. And I suppose what I'm going to try to do is, is lay out a situation here, and I'm, I'm going to kind of try to leave the uh, names out of this thing for obvious reasons. But let's just say, for example, somebody's in the drug business and they are transporting uh, contraband from one part of the country to another part of the country. One of the ways that they can do that is it's high risk, you know, if you've got a car going down I-90 and you've got a dog sniffing dog, you know, that, that's not a good combination, but if you could use a rail car and get it by there, that's fine. But one of the things that I understand is, is that on the trucks or where the wheels are on the rail car is kind of a convenient place for them to stash drugs. So if you have got cars that are in captive service that are going back and forth between the same locations all the time, and you have got some, you've got people on both ends of that, one to ship the drugs, send the drugs, and the other one to uh, retrieve the drugs, you've got a pretty good deal going for you. So how are you going to do that? Are you going to put a big arrow pointing down to that truck and say, here's the drugs? No, I don't think so. The other thing that goes on here too is, is that, well, I had a new hire with me a number of years ago, and uh, he was a very, very nice young fellow. Uh, he was from, he was black, and he was from, how did he say it, Racine, Wisconsin. And he would always, when he got some free time, he'd always like to go down to Chicago to the hood and talk about all his brothers down there. And I got to know this guy pretty well. And I said, interpret for me. Tell me, what is all this stuff on, what does that mean? He says, I have no idea. I have no idea. So I think what's happening here is that some of it is just you know, just being their personal marking, some of it is communications. And uh, unfortunately, I can't help you with much of that. Um, this was a picture of a car I took in Worthington probably about, oh, it's probably about a month ago. And this was one of these uh, uh, cement hoppers, I think, that the uh, Ellis and Eastern bring in here to their transload facility down at Org. And uh, it said, uh, what was it, droid on the side, and I think that, uh, but anyway, uh, on the side, I, I, I can't read it here either, but it said, there, anyway, these were the, you know, the virus vandals is what they had, it, their signature was on it. And then those, those two uh, Google-eyed characters on the side I thought were kind of cute. Um, this was taken by a friend of mine uh, down by Ashton, Iowa, and I think it, uh, with the four bays on it, I think it came out of the, uh, it was DDG cars is what I think it was. 
And uh, he took it out of his car window with a cell phone and I said, I gotta have a picture of that because look at the, look at the, uh, the talent going with that. And then you're working with spray cans. How many dollars worth of bubble or uh, rattle cans would it take to do that? I mean, but anyway, uh, that was kind of significant. This is one I took down in Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, apparently they didn't like CBS. Uh, at least I think that's what it is. And I don't know if it's the same CBS as what I'm thinking of. But uh, what the stuff on the left hand side, I don't have a clue. But uh, anyway, uh, graffiti is something that's definitely new. Any questions up to this time? Okay. Give you a little bit of, of uh, background here on the uh, Sioux Falls line. And that breaks off here at Org or Railroad Agate and went west. And uh, Chicago Northwestern abandoned that line in 1988. And uh, there was a guy up at Morton, Minnesota by the name of Larry Wood who had an uh, operation up there called the Minnesota Valley Transportation, and he ran trains back and forth uh, on a line up there. I think they went from Hanley Falls all the way up to some connection up there by the cities. And uh, at Morton, Minnesota, he had a, uh, a yard there, and, and uh, so anyway, he operated it for about four years. And uh, those were the two locomotives that he brought in originally and I think they were both ex-Milwaukee, and there was some business on the line, and uh, uh, track was in terrible shape, and, uh, but Larry Wood had a lot of uh, different locomotives, and we saw a bunch of them come through here, and, uh, but then if we were gonna get further west, uh, there would be some more of them over there that we did not see here. This is one of Larry Wood's locomotives. This picture was taken just on the east side of uh, Magnolia, but the DMVW stands for the D uh, Dakota, Missouri Valley, and Western. And, uh, of course, this is all gone now. I think it's what the uh, Red River Valley and Western, I think, is operating this now. But this locomotive would have come here. The Larry Wood couldn't handle it anymore, and so the, there was the uh, Buffalo Ridge Railroad Authority was formed, and that was the, uh, between Rock and Nobles Counties. And uh, they contracted with an outfit called uh, Rail uh, e Equipment Transportation, R-E-T-I. And that's when the name Nobles Rock uh, came out. And uh, they worked on that track for a couple of years. And this picture was taken in, um, in Worthington. And uh, when they got the track in shape, they had this inaugural run and they had all of the uh, county commissioners from both places, I think all the VIPs on there. I have to brag a little bit, I got invited to ride on that train and I rode it as far as uh, from Worthington to uh, uh, Adrian. And, uh, but uh, this was the way they got there. But they ran that for about four years. It kind of seems like four years was kind of a, a typical life uh, on this. Uh, when they gave it up, uh, it was just a matter of a, weeks later, an outfit called the Cascade Rail Corporation uh, got the operational rights to that. And I, that, that locomotive to your left uh, was one that, well, I wish we could see it better. But Cascade did some things that were kind of different. Uh, over by the uh, elevator in Laverne, there was a siding track, and they would bring in a lot of locomotives, a lot of switchers, and they had this one in there, and they did, you know, kind of little cosmetic work on them to get them going. I mean, I know they changed out a lot of uh, windshields, you know, to get the new safety glass, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. But then this locomotive was the Golden Spike. Uh, I mean, that's a kind of a glorious name but uh, nobody wanted this locomotive because the way it was wired, you couldn't run it in multiple units with any other locomotives. You could only run it by itself. And they finally got rid of it, but it, uh, I think it ended up probably going to some elevator or something just to switch local. This Cascade Rail Corp had two operations in addition to the one in Minnesota. Uh, there was one up in Minnesota that went through Fergus Falls and there was another one in South Dakota and they just could not keep anything on the track. Yeah, their stuff was coming off, and they were just having all kinds of financial problems. 
Independent Locomotive Services, who is at ILS, they're out of Bethel, Minnesota, which is up just north of the Twin Cities. And uh, they've had these locomotives here for a long time. And finally, they just says, no, you know, we're going to, you know, you know, game over. Uh, but during that period of time, they got a transfer, and they got them painted, they got them up to upgraded. And uh, 2001, the Buffalo Ridge Authority gave an operational lease to what they now call the Minnesota Southern. The Minnesota Southern was owned, as I understand it, by a gentleman from Heron Lake, Minnesota. Brent had been involved in a very serious accident and was a double amputee. Both his legs were gone. And I understand he had some pretty good arms because he would take his arms and he would crawl his way and he run the locomotives because that was about the only, you know, he couldn't fix track or, you know, he couldn't switch cars or pull pins or anything like that. But uh, Brent was, uh, had, a, had this thing for a, for a while. And to give you an idea, now this was just on the, uh, uh, that's I-90 in the backside, so this is just on the north side of I-90 there at Adrian. Look at all the ties that they're putting in on that. I mean, that track was really in tough shape and it needed a lot of work. Uh, and that was the, the Minnesota Southern in Worthington. Um, 2017, Ellis and Eastern bought the whole works. Ellis and Eastern is a subsidiary of an outfit called Knife River. I don't know if that means anything to you. Knife River is a very huge corporation uh, that specializes in aggregate and road building, you know, and, and stuff like that. And um, those are those two locomotives that were green. I mean, those things were painted Minnesota Southern. They were pa painted, uh, or, or, Minnesota, or Nobles Rock. They were Minnesota Southern. Ellis and Eastern took them, blanked everything out, and then they've got EE -E on them. And uh, yeah, so they're the ones that are operating this whole thing now. A year ago, Ellis and Eastern ran a Christmas train. You know, and I think it was from Rushmore to, uh, uh, they probably to Laverne is probably what they did. That was a flat car and they had trees inside there and stuff like that. And, and I know this was on a Sunday and I think I, uh, I don't even know if I changed clothes after church. I got out of church and I headed over there with the camera as fast as I could and I was able to catch it. Um, do we have time for a story? Ellis and Eastern boys are good boys. Does the name Emmett Gonzalez mean anything to any of you? I'm, I'm sitting, yeah. Little Emmett Gonzalez was four years old and had a brain tumor. He was to Rochester, Minnesota. I think they did surgery. I think they did everything they did for him. The little boy came home. He loved trains. The boys from the Ellis and Eastern got him up in the cab of one of these locomotives and they gave him a, a train ride and they let him put his hand on the throttle, they let him blow the whistle and the whole works, you know, and that kid was just in his glory. I did not know Emmett that well, but I did know his grandfather fairly well. And I said, maybe you'd like to come down to Sibley to see our trains in Sibley. And that little kid was down there, he was just in his glory. And his funeral was what, a short month ago? He, he died a few weeks short of... Uh, or a few days short of his uh, fifth birthday. But Ellis and Eastern, you know, just because of the, those guys being the good guys that they were in a time of need, I, I, I respect them. Uh, I can tell you some st other stories that maybe aren't quite as great. Oh, this was a piece of machinery that it was in Worthington. And um, that's what you call a track tamper. Union Pacific owned Two of these units, very, very high tech, supposed to be able to go along. Now, when they adjust the ballast to straighten out a track, to firm it up, they'll have fingers that go down, like paddles that'll go down to, to take the stones, the ballast, underneath and squeeze it in underneath the tie. And this particular unit was set up to do that at three ties at a time. And so that this machine was able to go along continuously and it would come down, grab three, tamp it, go to the next, grab three, tamp it, 
tampet. And this was supposed to be the ultimate technology in rail tamping, the real ultimate cat's meow. It turned out it was down here by uh, the fire hall, and there was a guy down there, and there was a shiny pickup. And I said, well, you know, if, if that's a tamper, there's a place where we know that you really need to do some work because the, the track was so bad, it was just lucky to keep the trains hooked together. And I told this guy about it. So on Saturday, the sun was right, and I came down there Saturday afternoon, and the, one of the two guys there, he recognized me. And he took me around that machine and he explained everything to me. And what had happened was this is they had a hydraulic motor go out in the thing and they, they were frustrated as could be. Well, then when they got the hydraulic motor in there, there was a valve that went out and they, rather than dump 500 gallons of oil on the ground, they had to send out and get a tank and pumps and everything out of there. These guys were not happy. But anyway, I got the story of, of that particular thing. The car behind it, had paddles that would go on the top of the rail and they would vibrate. They'd be, shake the ground. And so what would happen would be is, is they would firm up that ballast and firm up that rock behind it. And so this was designed to be a continuous operation that uh, maybe didn't work out quite as well. Uh, this is a rail grinder. Uh, this was taken out here by uh, the elevator and uh, this is done by Loram. Uh, my son worked for Loram for a while in the office, and I was able to get a tour of the uh, setup facility on it, and that's another story, but uh, these rail grinders are some very interesting operations. And what happens there basically is, is they want to have the top of the rail shaped to an exact profile so that the wheel that makes contact with the rail will only have a contact area of maybe the width of a dime. They don't want it any more than that. And the reason for that is, is so that uh, that reduces the amount of, of uh, draft or the, how, hard they, uh, how easy the cars pull if they're, if they're not uh, making much contact with the rail. Uh, another thing that happens is, is that the wheels are Large, larger diameter on the inside and smaller diameter on the outside. And so when they go around the curve, when those things kind of try to self-center, uh, actually the wheels, with being bigger in diameter, when you go around the curve, that outside rail has to, tr the, the wheel has to travel longer, a greater distance than the inside, and that's all accommodated by the shape of the wheels. So I mean, it, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in these things that we don't realize. Um, this particular machine, uh, oh, they had all of these, they call them stones that are grinding wheels that go along. Uh, really something to see that at night when you, when you get them things going. So, um, just a couple of other things. Uh, I'm going to call them business trains because I don't know what kind of business they were up to. This was a Chicago Northwestern business train that came through Worthington. Uh, a little bit later, uh, Union Pacific, uh, well, they, when they got a hold of it, they came through and that lead locomotive is a double-engined unit uh, and that's kind of a unique outfit for if you're into train locomotives, that's kind of a, well, we got to see that one come through town. We got to see the Challenger come through town. Um, this was probably one of the last times, Jim, am I close to this? One of the last times where this locomotive was out and really in good condition. Uh, what happened was is, is that tender off of that got pulled off and got run with another locomotive that Union Pacific had, they called the Big Boy. And uh, the, they had another junker locomotive they put with it. And the thing never ran for years, and they donated a whole bunch of this stuff to the old Rock Island shops down in Silvis. Uh, and that would be Silvis, is that Iowa or no, Illinois? It, you know, it's right on the border, it's the Quad Cities. But anyway, uh, that I talked to a friend of mine in the si uh, cities on Saturday, and he says they've got that thing just about restored uh, because the people that uh, bought that whole thing, they said there's no end to the money down there. So anyway, that is being saved. And uh, now this is another business train that came through. Now, somebody told me that this was a, uh, 
a bunch of executives from the Union Pacific inspecting some bridges over in the east. I don't know if it is or not. I have no way of knowing. And this was another one that came through town with the uh, uh, a locomotive they had for the uh, employees. Tom T. Hall was right. Faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. You know, you got to make her work for you. Thank you. Thank you. I promised our chief technical uh, expert here that we'd be done in an hour, and I guess I've tried to do that. Uh, I will be around, and I will answer any questions. I will visit with any of you as long as you choose and until Beth kicks us out. So uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for your kind attention.